The identifier was the identifier for the image. In other words, that is the primary key that identifies the image. The occurrence ID is the parent. That is the occurrence or specimen that I'm related to if I'm this image. So that's the foreign key. And that's the field that relates me to another table. So let me go look at the other table. So this is just about images, right? I have no fields that describe specimens here. I'm keeping my concept of an image pure, except for the occurrence ID which says, who's my daddy? Now, this is the table structure for the simple Darwin core, for a specimen. And here I have all the Darwin core fields. I've seen them before. And way down here I have the occurrence ID. So that's my unique identifier. That's my primary key for my simple Darwin core table. It uniquely identifies a record here because it's a specimen. And a specimen is a type of an occurrence. A little key there in Microsoft Access means that that's a primary key. It must be unique and it uniquely identifies a record. And down below there's other information that, about that field, one of which is indexed yes, no duplicates. You cannot duplicate a value in that field between records. So a database is putting in all kinds of controls here. It's saying I can't reuse an occurrence ID, which is very useful to me. Because I'm tired, I've been entering data all day, and I see a record and I type it in, and it says no, it's already in there. I go, oh. I guess it's time to go home, I'm getting sleepy because I'm, I'm starting to duplicate data and the database says no, go home. So it's useful in that respect. There are all kinds of other things that databases can do to constrain the data that go into a field. But so far we're only talking about the fields that relate them. There's another concept in databases called an index. It's not that important to most people, but just so that you hear about the idea. An index tells the database, this field is important to me for sorting or for searching. Okay, not all fields are. Some fields are just commentary, nobody's going to search in them, but they're there for added information. Other fields, like a country or a state or county, those are fields that you are likely to want to search on. So the concept of an index is a database's way of making sure that that's fast. So it does some other things behind the scenes so that when you ask questions about that field, it can give you the answers quickly. And that's what an index is. So when we go to the GBIF site to do a query, we're given a list of fields that can be queried on. And it's a list of about 10 fields. It's not all of Darwin Core because not all of Darwin Core has been indexed by GBIF. They've determined that these are the 10 most popular fields to query on. These are the ones for which we will create indexes. Why do they do that? Why don't they just index everything and give you all that freedom? And the reason is cost. Because indexes take space and they take time to produce. So you can imagine that every field that you add that is indexed creates a higher cost for the underlying database. So they choose to optimize that and they choose to give you the fields that are most likely to be of interest to you for querying on, but not all of them. And so this is a trade-off that's always done 
in database design. Okay. The next thing, the next concept on my list to tell you about for databases is a controlled vocabulary. A controlled vocabulary is another way to constrain you, to take away your free will to be creative, with the result that your data will be more consistent. So databases are very conservative things. They want to control you. And when you design them, you design them to control you in the ways that you are uh, happy with. <laughs> the ways that, that allow you to not make mistakes. So a controlled vocabulary is another way to do that. A controlled vocabulary, you have all seen data entry forms on the web or for databases in which you are allowed to pick something. You're not allowed to type in a value, you're only allowed to pick it. For example, when you buy something online and it asks what country are you from, you must pick the country from a list you can't create your own autonomous country to enter into that form. So that's what a controlled vocabulary is. In that case, it's a controlled vocabulary for the country field. Now in Darwin Core, we have plenty of fields where the recommendation is to use a controlled vocabulary, such as basis of record. So basis of record is a perfectly good candidate for using a controlled vocabulary in a database. And I'll show you a quick example of what that looks like in my model here. So in this access database, I created a table. My table's name is basis of record lookup. And the value, this has just one field in it. And the field name is basis of record. And the values in there are all the legal values of the basis of record. So you can quickly visualize that this looks like a drop-down list. And it's exactly how it's used in the database. This is used to populate a drop-down list so that you can only choose these values for a basis of record. So in my database, the table that contains basis of record is the simple Darwin Core table. Here's my basis of record field. You can see that in the database that I have constructed, I set the basis of record to be, to use a controlled vocabulary. And that's why I have this drop down button here. If I click on it, I get exactly the values in the basis of record table. I can't type a basis of record, I can only select one. So I select something that corresponds with the type of record in my database, a preserved specimen. Let me expand that. Ah, I can't point very well. Ah. Okay, one second. I need to trick it. Okay, I've tricked it. So, I'm only allowed to put legal values in the basis of record field because I made my database use a control vocabulary for that field. And you can do that for any field. In sophisticated databases, you can do a whole set of fields together. You can do all of geography at once. You pick a geography record, which is a combination of country, state, county. You pick the whole thing. 
and have it populate your database. But this is just a simple example. Now, the curious among you might wonder what was going on here and why did I have to put a one? The reason is I defined my simple Darwin Core database to have a primary key, to have an identifier. Remember the little key next to occurrence ID? It won't allow me to enter a record that doesn't have an identifier. I can't be John unless I officially call myself John. I don't have any data or digital existence without it. So I was forced to put an identifier in my primary key in order to create a record. It's the only thing that was required in this record Every other field in the whole table is blank. But that one can't be. And that was the database trying to constrain me to say, don't do something stupid. Don't create a record unless you're going to use it. You are not going to use it if it doesn't have an identifier. Put an identifier. That's what it was telling me all this time when I was drop downs or when those dialog boxes came up. So by now, you're getting the idea that databases are very constraining. And they're that way for a reason. They're that way on purpose. They're that way so that you maximize the consistency of the data that you enter, which does not happen in Excel spreadsheets. Then finally, Something that I'll only mention, and I will not show it to you, is that databases allow you to build queries. That is, to do, to ask questions. And this is where the real power of them comes in. One of the real powers of them to come in is the asking of questions. And the way the questions are asked is something called a structured query language. If you've ever seen these letters SQL, that's what it means. It's the language that's used, sort of a standard language across all databases to create queries, to ask questions of the data. Okay, so these are the basic concepts for databases. I haven't shown you how to build them. I've only shown you sort of what they might look like. The one other thing that I'd like to show before I uh, say my last two statements about database design is kind of a standard view of what the database, relational database structures look like. So here's a diagram. Some people would call this a database model. It's a visual model. And it contains most of the interesting information about the structure of the database. It shows us that the databases consist of two tables, one for specimens called simple Darwin core and one for images called simple images. And that the two are related to each other by the occurrence IDs. This one, primary key, identifies the specimen. This one, the foreign key, that identifies the specimen for that image. And then the little line between them says that's what they're related on, the occurrence ID. And then one other bit of information in this diagram that is common for this type of a diagram is something called the cardinality. It says how are they related exactly? It says, for every one occurrence ID, for every unique occurrence ID in a specimen, there can be as many images as you like. So that's one to many, or one to infinity. That's the relationship between the two. Okay? Which means we can repeat occurrence ID here as many times as we want, for as many images as we want. 